can I say? William Regal is amazing. Welcome to this edition of the Game Changer Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Nate the Effing Great, and I'm being joined here by the one, the only, the fabulous, the very beautiful, and guys, I can tell you right now, on my list, she may have been number three, but in my heart, she's always number one. It is the one and only SoCal <laughs> Val, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, hello. What a majestic entrance I was. I think that was the most majestic we've ever had. Gorgeous theme song. Honestly, I think you're right, because always it's been like either Triple H or Stephanie McMahon or something like that. But I thought, you know what? we got to go a little classy. And I, if I'm not mistaken, you are actually recording from London, so that's yeah, not too fitting, far. right? Uh, yep, exactly, and it's, and it's not too far from Blackpool from what I understand, so why not incorporate one of the biggest things to come out of Blackpool, England, that being William Regal. I mean, why not? So, guys, we usually do talk about wrestling in these podcasts, but this time around, Miss Valerie, she is a part of this wonderful group called the Screen Stalkers. Definitely check them out because they are absolutely awesome. They do movie reviews, they talk about rumors, they talk about so much stuff. So I thought to give you guys a little more of a preface on the mindset that she has as a screen stalker. Remember, they're always watching. Honestly, we need to end the show like that with that catchphrase. You are, <laughs> you're the only one that can do it justice. So I apologize to everybody at Screen Stalkers if I botch that up. But we're going to be talking about movies that we've kind of talked about throughout the year. Some of the ones that we liked, some of the ones that we thought were kind of meh. And then there's some that are just absolutely downright bleh to say the least. <laughs> so, I will actually start this list off with, uh, I think, one that a lot of people definitely should not be surprised, that when it came to starting the year, the first movie that I knew I had to see that was going to start off this year right was going to be the one that featured my boy, James McAvoy, Samuel L. Jackson, Bruce Willis. Of course, I'm talking about the third installment of the Unbreakable series, Glass. I absolutely loved this movie. It tells the tale, of course, about what happened with Unbreakable, where we had Bruce Willis as well. Samuel Jackson's characters were introduced. Then we go into Split, which basically introduces the James McAvoy multiple personality character. And then you have all three of these characters combined into an institute where they're trying to basically be reformed. They're basically being told, well, you know, these things should not be happening. But we do see a lot of epicness. We see a lot of great action. And honestly, you guys, it's just another showcase where I think to myself, hmm... James McAvoy, Oscar nomination. I'm still waiting on that right now because for a guy who literally, I remember watching in the movie Wanted, I just saw him being this, you know, kind of like simple character, kind of blandish. Uh, of course, th during the movie it gets better and better. But just seeing that character and seeing him progress as an actor to being, you know, Dr. Xavier, to him doing all of these great deals. He's also going to be in It Chapter 2 later on this year. Oh, trust me, going to be reviewing that. That's going to be awesome. But this role in particular is probably my favorite role that he's ever done because he has to play 30 different characters. And from the music tones to the way his body moves, you definitely can tell that he's always playing a different character. Or you can tell when he transitions into another character. You can definitely tell when he's playing a woman, when he's playing you know, Dennis, when he's playing Barry, when he's playing eventually the Beast. It's just one of those characters characters that's so hard to do but McAvoy my god does he do that character justice it is so well done honestly one of the first movies of this year that I thought yes I love it I love it I love it but I will not lie to you guys it is not my favorite movie of the year and it shouldn't surprise anybody <laughs> uh what that favorite movie is going to be but honestly I don't know if you got a chance to see Glass or do you have anything to kind of add on Miss Valerie about the one and only McAvoy I do because yeah, well, you know, I, I've not seen that yet, but I think there's something to be said for actors like Samuel L. Jackson, like, just, just the roles that they choose. Like, for example, Leonardo DiCaprio always think makes great choices in the roles that he that he chooses. And if I know that he's in the film or the TV show, I know it's going to be good, because I, I respect his choice as an actor. And anything with Samuel L. Jackson, I think this has to be good. He had to read the script and go, this is going to be a good one. So I think it's just, it's, it's having that respect for the choices that they make. And Samuel L. Jackson is an absolute icon, for sure. Definitely, definitely. No, I definitely do agree with that. And a lot of people, they might not be you know, big on the Bruce Willis bandwagon, but in this role, he plays it pretty well. He does play the hero. He does have like these supernatural abilities, and his character is that you know, too much, it isn't too little. It's the right amount where it's like, okay, you can kind of tolerate Bruce Willis. And that's one of the reasons why I love this movie. It's a fair balance between all three of these characters, all three of these actors. It definitely hits on their strong suits, 
And that's just what movies need to have. They need to embrace the positives, embrace the strengths of what these char- what these actors can bring to the table and show the case them on the big screen. And that is exactly why... For sure! <laughs> yeah, and you know what, Bruce Willis deserves a lot of credit, too. Like, I, I, other than being a huge action star, like him in Friends, you know, he showed his comedic chops as well. I think he's a really well-rounded actor, like Samuel L. Jackson as well. Definitely. No, I definitely do agree with that. So, I got my first movie out of the way. Miss Valley, what is your early memories of movies as far as this year goes? You know what's great is I'm working for Screen Stalker. Thank you so much for the plug there. My my excuse to go to the movies or the, the cinema, as they call it here, has been you know for research. But I, I also get to kind of pick and choose the ones that I want to see. And obviously, being a big Marvel fan, one of the first sort of tasks I was given was to review Captain Marvel. And I'll be honest with you, Nate. Like between you and I, I was really not excited to see the film. And it's funny we're kind of segueing Samuel L. Jackson here. I was like, well, you know, he's in it. It's got to be good. Marvel's usually pretty. Good. At least it's going to be an entertaining thrill ride because it's Marvel. I loved it. And I loved the female empowerment kind of um, aspect to it. I loved the comedy with the cat. I, and I don't, I'm not to be the cat person, as you know. But I thought it was such a great uh, storyline. I love they integrated her into Avengers as well. I don't know if you did. you have a chance to see Captain Marvel? Of course I got the chance to see Captain Marvel. I think I got the chance to see it at least twice, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, what's actually crazy is that uh, we had a person... In this uh, in this county in this state, who actually holds the record for the most times seen uh, Captain Marvel, which I think was 146 times right now, if I'm not mistaken. Oh my god! I know he is very dedicated, and honestly, I love the fact that he was that dedicated to it. And he also kind of talks about you know some of the certain details that they had about it, whether it's you know uh, something that may have happened you know during that time zone or something that may have been, you know, hinted at during the comics and stuff like that. But, yeah, no, I agree with you. I enjoyed uh, Captain Marvel, and for a lot of people, of course, there is the controversy that Brie Larson had uh, after the movie about not wanting to really focus on, you know, the male de- the male demographic, but more focusing on the female demographic as well as the critiques from them. Uh, but there's also a lot of other yeah. issues in there, but we're not going into that. We're not going into the negative part of it. Let's talk about the positives <laughs> about this. Keeping it positive here. Oh, we, we try our best, but, you know... We are also we also also frenemies, so we'll see what happens as this episode goes on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people must be really shocked that we're agreeing on a movie. But honestly, Captain Marvel, like you, you and I talked about it when I saw it, and I was like, I really, really loved it. I love the fact that it, it was it was an over the top female empowerment. It was just she was just a badass, and she was very relatable. She's a very likable girl. I loved that she was kind of kind of the girl next door. It wasn't some, you know, like Angelina Jolie movies. She's very, you know, smoldering and she's sexy and we love that. But Brie Larson can kind of play like just, just the nice girl that had, you know, amazing powers. And also I loved the, the, the throwback, the nostalgia, the fact that they were like a blockbuster video and, yes. and it was that kind of 80s, 90s. Right? I mean, we, I, I loved that. And for, for being a 90s kid, I was born in 86, but like I consider myself a 90s kid. It was so fun just to kind of relive that era. I loved that they did that. It's one of those things where they even showed it in the trailer and already people are just just like, okay, so even if this movie is not as good as we want it to be, at least we get a nostalgic moment where we see a Hollywood, we see a blockbuster video in this, you know, movie. And, you know, they do a great job. And honestly, for a lot of people, you know, that might critique it, you cannot deny that some of the CGI was actually really good. Samuel Jackson, oh my God, he literally looked like he went back into a time machine and aged so well. How freaky was that? How freaky was that? Oh my God. (laughs) It was just absolutely insane just to see that kind of stuff. Now, obviously, a lot of people have said that, you know, the Coulson character didn't look so well with the CGI. That's kind of hard to overlook and kind of deny. But at the same time, it's still one of the things where you have to understand that with CGI, we're still not perfect with it. So sue us, whatever. But we at least are trying to... That was damn near perfect, I thought. Well, that's... <laughs> I, I think that, you know, I, I saw it was just kind of like, nah, maybe he looks a little too plastic-ish or something like that. But we also got Yay. introduced into, you know, different characters and different kind of, you know, stories that go into the... Uh, <clears throat> that into the Marvel Universe. And, of course, it's just absolutely wonderful seeing these characters just growing and becoming a lot better. And, of course, this was basically the prelude of what we were going to be expecting for the next movie. Of course, we're definitely going to be talking about that, but I think we'll save that as kind of like the quote-unquote main event of this, because there's so much that we could talk about when we talk about the next big Marvel movie. But since we are talking about Marvel, I'll go into another highlight of this year for me, me being a Spider-Man fan. I cannot deny the fact that I loved Spider-Man Far From Home. 
it was a really well done movie. I loved Tom Holland playing the role of Spider-Man again, and he plays it to a T. I loved the chemistry between uh, Tom Holland and Zendaya. Yes, people will say like, but it was awkward. It was weird. Yeah, that's because they are kind of awkward, weird teens. Peter Parker is supposed to be awkward. I agree. It, it's. It's one of those things where it's like, they're, at least they're being natural about it. Some people cannot express raw emotion like everybody else. It can't always be like a movie where it's just like, oh, I love thee so much. I want to be with thee so much. Okay, I'm going back into my Shakespearean deal. I'm already past that. Moving on from that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, no, I actually really liked that. I thought Jake Gyllenhaal, oh my gosh, played Mysterio very well. Uh, the way that they brought in the elements was really good. I'm not going to spoil the entire thing because I really want people to see it. It's just a really fun movie. And plus, we get a nice little cameo from a actor who played a very pivotal role in the Spider-Man universe, which I was freaking out. I literally screamed my head off as soon as I saw him. I'm just like, yes, thank you, thank you. Should we reveal it? I feel like people probably have seen it already. Oh yeah, let's let's reveal it. Why not? <laughs> it is indeed J.K. Simmons, a.k.a. J. Jonah Jameson, as soon as... I love uh, him. <laughs> it just was one of those moments like, yes, thank you so much, I love it. My God, they it's literally one of those things where it's like, well, we couldn't find anybody else to play the role as well as he did, so let's just bring him back to this anyway. I'm totally oh fine with God, that. Oh, my God, he's amazing. Oh, just all oh, the nostalgic feels. I, I, I love well, this movie. But I have to ask you, I mean, you, you being, you know, a, a film critic as well, as, you know, if we call ourselves critics, mm-hmm. I, were you, because I have to say, I was pretty like, why are they doing this again? I loved the Tobey Maguire movies. I really, really did. Uh, the second one, uh, the third ones were okay, but especially the first one, I really loved it. I love Willem Dafoe. I loved him as Green Goblin. Um, I loved James Franco being in it. I thought Tobey Maguire was kind of like similar to Tom Holland, where he kind of plays it very um, awkward and, you know, the every man and kind of shy and, and nerdy. I love that. That's how Peter Parker is. And then when I saw Tom Holland as Spider-Man, I was like, I totally get it. This is why they remade it. And at first, I really wasn't into the idea. Now, I'm so glad that they rebooted it for sure. But were you apprehensive when you heard they were going to do Spider-Man again as a reboot? You know, I've had a lot of people basically get really annoyed at the fact that they did their third reboot for Spider-Man. But at the same time, unfortunately, they were not going to be able to get your Andrew Garfield back on, so they had to find somebody to kind of, you know, take the reins and kind of take the you know, role of Spider-Man, and, you know, Tom Holland definitely does fit the bill for it. For me, I always love Spider-Man movies, I'm always for Spider-Man movies, so even if it is a reboot, I'm still okay with it. I know there's a lot of people, like I said, that have been so annoyed at the fact that, oh, we got another Spider-Man movie, we got another Spider-Man movie going on. Yeah. And, you know, even even people are, fed, there were some people that were even fed up, oh, great, we got another one, Into the Spider-Verse, but Into the Spider-Verse was amazing, do not deny that, because it was awesome. Uh, and it's a different it did very well as well. The reviews and, and as far as like the movie critics and, and the fans, they loved it. Oh, definitely, definitely. And it's still one of those things where, again, it's another Spider-Man movie. I'm okay with this. They're bringing other Spider-Mans into different universes. Say what? Okay, we got... Okay, I love this. We're introducing Spider-Gwen. Just take my damn money already. I don't care at this point. Take my money. <laughs> just, t- just take my money. Take my pounds. Take my dollars. Take my pesos. <laughs> what- whatever currency I need, just just take it. Just take it. I don't pesos. care. <laughs> oh, my gosh. But, yeah, like I, like I said, Tom Holland and you know, Spider-Man Far From Home, absolutely wonderful. So many great callbacks. And also, I'm just going to say this right now, even dead, I'm the hero. Are you kidding me? That is so Tony Stark esque, and I loved it. And it's like, yes, he still has a presence, even though even though he's gone. I loved it. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned the Andrew Garfield ones because I I loved those too. But they were, don't you agree? They were so dark. They were very moody, and uh, yeah, I, I liked them. But the, the Spider Man's with, with Tobey Maguire, I thought were real comicy and fun. And then the Andrew Garfield one came out, and I was like, oh, they're doing it again. And I felt like those were really. Um, uh, not disturbing, but just a lot moodier and edgier, don't you think? Um, I think I've stated some of my, uh, what what was it, my, my grievances on these Spider- Amazing Spider-Man movies. First one, I was just kind of like, oh, okay, this is kind of nice. And then the second one, I've literally still stated to this day, is the one that I have a burning passion of hatred for, just because of <laughs> everything that went d- down there. It was a love movie, there were certain parts of the plot that I just did not understand. They misused Rhino, they misused, you know, bringing in Harry Osborne. They introduced too many characters into it, and it definitely hurt the film a bit. They pushed the whole love deal just so that they can 
kill off Gwen Stacy at the end of it. It's just one of those movies where I thought yeah. they had so many issues that they had to address in this movie that there was not enough movie to do it. And maybe it was just even they too just long. They just kind of crammed it all together, I think. I think you're right, yeah. Yeah. And they kind of crammed it in there just like, you know, a California walk-in closet. Oh, sorry, was that a little too much shade? <laughs> That's the truth, let's be honest. It was, it was excess, and you know, you know I'm a bit extra, you know. Well, you know what, like I said, we're, we're staying positive here. I'm not trying to start anything, not until we reach the uh, end of the month. Then I'll start something there, because we got all out at the end of the month. Definitely plugging <laughs> that right now. So, but yeah, like, like I said, I, w- I wish I would have loved the Andrew Garfield ones a bit more, but were they darker? I think at some points they definitely was a lot darker. Definitely in the scenery, it definitely seemed a lot darker than... A lot of the other ones were, you know, you had the bright colors. You had those moments where, yeah, it could get dark, but at least there's still a good chance there's going to be light. Yep, there it is. But yeah, it's yeah. just like almost 24-7, dark, 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 dark. Oh, a little tiny glimmer of light. Dark, 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 dark. But Totally. <laughs> but, you know, we got, we kind of moved on from that. But So was there any other movie that kind of stood out to you that was just absolutely awesome or definitely worth talking about? Well, I, I, I love that Screen Stalker lets me review the Disney live-action remakes. We actually did reviews. If, if you want to check it out, listeners, it's, of course, on YouTube. Look for Screen Stalker. Um, now, being a Disney person, like, people are like, oh, I like Disney. I'm like, listen, I grew up in Disney. I'm from Orlando. And, you know, I used to be from California where they had Disneyland. But I'm a Disney World kind of girl. You know, we grew up with all the Disney, uh, you know, attractions and movies and everything's very Disney-centric in Orlando. So it's sort of ingrained in you in, in a young age to like Disney. But I just love what Disney represents. I love that it's happiness and it's some of it's for children, sure. But there's a movie that um, that I was asked to review. Thank goodness that I thought really appealed to kids and um, older audience as well. And of course, I'm talking about Aladdin. And you know, it's funny because all the guys at Screen Stalker, to be honest, were like, "Oh, we didn't love it. We didn't like Will Smith." And I'm like, I went into it with really high expectations, not going to lie, and they were so exceeded. Like, I loved everything about it. I loved the music. I loved the fun. I loved the love story. I loved that Will Smith was not trying to be Robin Williams. Because here's the thing, you know, to have that task of doing the roles as the genie, when it was so iconic with Robin Williams, you can't go in there trying to be Robin Williams. And he wasn't. He put his own little Will Smith spin on things. He kept it fun. There was some some adult humor in there, which I liked. Even in the songs, he kind of added his, like, ha-ha, you know, his... The, the kind of noise that he does in his own songs, like Miami and, and all of his hits. And he made it funny, made it, you know, accessible to an older crowd. But, of course, the kids loved it, the colorful scenes and, and you know, the, the silliness of it. And I thought the story was great. I loved that the, the girl who's um, portraying Jasmine, I actually was a fan of hers, uh, Naomi Scott. Uh, I had some songs of hers uh, from years ago. So she's been a vocalist for a long time. She could carry a tune. So could Aladdin. She was a great actress. She was likable, relatable. I just thought the entire thing was was a masterpiece. And what's funny is, I didn't even like Aladdin as a kid. Like, I loved Beauty and the Beast as a kid. That was my favorite. That and Pocahontas. I hope they do a love action. Pocahontas, Disney, if you're listening, hello. <laughs> um, but I actually appreciated Aladdin the live action remake a lot more than the live action remake of Beauty and the Beast. And I I think the, the, what I noted in the Screen Talker review was I think that the difference is in Beauty and the Beast, I'm so, such a Harry Potter fan, so it was a little weird to see Emma Watson, who's so synonymous with Harry Potter, portraying Belle. Then Dan Stevens, who is from Downton Abbey, one of my favorite shows ever. It was sort of all these actors that I'd seen in a bunch of other things. In Aladdin, they sort of cast people that were not as known. So Naomi Scott and then um, Masood, I forget his first name, uh, as Aladdin. Obviously, Will Smith is, is an icon and a huge movie star, but the others, I didn't really know them as anything else, but to me, they'll always be Aladdin and Jasmine, and I think that's what they got right. I think they also stepped it up with the choreography, with, with the vocals. I honestly thought it was just amazing, and my sister, who has uh, three children, actually, went to see it, and I was just like, I'm not even going to say anything. I said, I, you're going to love it, and I couldn't wait to hear her review, and of course, the kids loved it. She loved it. She's been a big Will Smith fan for years, and she said the same thing, that we loved that Will Smith was himself and didn't try to be Robin Williams. She loved the, the music, and honestly, I think it's just one of those things that, you know, I don't have any children, but if you did, you could really take the whole family to see this movie and enjoy it, so, what did you think, Nate? Oh, boy, so this streak has ended. Um, so when it comes to oh, this no! movie, when, when, it, when it comes to this movie, if you listen to uh, my review, you'll def- people have definitely known how I feel about this movie, and we even take some, uh, 
we do mention it quite a few times. This was one of those movies that I did have expectations for, but when it came to, like you said, with Will Smith, he can't replicate Robin Williams. And for his performance, I liked it. I thought that he did a really good job. Was he better than Robin Williams? Some parts I thought maybe he was, but there was other parts where it's like, you know, there's just very hard to replicate what Robin Williams, you know, laid the foundation for. It's oh, sure. really hard to, you know, copy that. Uh, I am with the majority that did not like who played the Jafar character because Jafar is, you know, this evil maniacal person. He's like a dictator in the end, but he's just kind of like this very soft, very toned down kind of deal there. I was okay with the fact that they, you know, had, you know, Iago not really be a focal point of the movie, but it's like, okay, so hopefully in, you know, you know the sequel, that which I guarantee they're going to make, we don't have that kind of annoying deal where, you know, Gilbert Godfrey comes in, he voices it, oh gosh, that's going to be rough. Um, yeah, th- and, and Iago was really not a thing at all. Until the very end. And I will say this, that I've said yeah. that I liked the movie up until about A Whole New World. After that song was done, I felt like the movie started going downhill. For those that have listen to Mary you know what I'm talking about. Uh, One thing I really hated was that uh, instead of maybe Jafar finding out about Aladdin a different way, instead of maybe just saying, like, oh, I just want to kill this guy just so that he gets out of my way, it's just through the power of assumption that he's able to say, oh, you're Aladdin. You're this treat rat. You're blah, 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 blah. It's like, you would assume that through, you assume that I understand somebody would be like yeah but he's logical he recognizes the face and everything like that it's like it's stupid though why would you have that why would you not have that kind of deal where Aladdin gets you know has the it just it just really it was just one of those things like oh this is so dumb the climax is what really put me over the edge where I'm like oh I hate I hate the ending of this movie because of the fact that oh my god I'm so sad to hear that it, here's the reason why. In the, in the original, we had, you know, we had swords flying down. We had Abu turning into a little toy. We had the unraveling of carpet. Uh, we had Jafar making, like, these... He's being such a douche, but he's also making these, like, puns of, you know, oh, don't toy with me. Things are unraveling fast. Do you get the point? I'm getting warmed up. And he's just being this evil, maniacal deal. It's so cheesy, but it's cheesy in the best way. And then we get this giant serpent. Oh, my gosh, if they would have done this, it would have been amazing. Did they do that? No. They made a giant bird. Why? Just, you had a great climax scene. I don't want to agree with you, but at least you're entertaining about it. It's, it's just, oh, it just got so frustrating. Because I watched it two times. First time I was like, okay, I like this movie. I like this movie. Second time around, it's like, okay, I really start seeing where it just goes downhill. And especially, I took friends to see it, and they were saying, basically opening my eyes to that, they were say, saying, yeah, they had a great climax in the original. In the, this one, they had a giant bird. It's like, yeah, really, it just... If they would have made Iago into a giant serpent, that would have been interesting. That would have been cool. Just seeing him kind of slithering throughout the sea, the streets, oh my gosh, that would have been awesome. But no, we get a giant bird, something we've seen before. Like, I, I will say that, I, I, I hate to say it, it pains me to say it, but I will agree with you on the one thing. I, I liked the guy who played Jafar, but I found Jafar in the original line a lot more sinister, a lot more dark. This guy was, like you said, a little more soft-spoken, and I thought he did a good job, but I think, yeah, that, I, I will agree with that. Yeah, man, but... But you didn't like, like, my, fa- my favorite scene was the, was the Prince Ali uh, musical. Uh, Prince Ali, oh. na, 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 na. Oh, that was the best scene in the whole movie. <laughs> Don't get us in trouble for copyrights, Val. I only got so much... <laughs> like. <Darn> <laughs> <laughs> this is, why have we not done karaoke up until this point, right? Oh, now I'm gosh. thinking that should be our next podcast. Oh, my God. That possibly. Honestly... I, I think I think the next t- time that we meet up, it's going to have to be a thing. We're just going to have to have somebody recording us doing karaoke. That's going to be again on the bucket. I've already mentioned like one thing we need to have on the bucket list. Uh, this is going to be another thing too. It's just you know have you know two surrogates wrestling wrestling for our honor. Second thing, we need to have a karaoke night. That's going to have to be something that gets put put on before we just hang it up and call everything good. But that's something for a later time, you guys. So getting back to Aladdin, <laughs> like 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 I said. I liked it to a point, but there's just, you know, some points where it's just like, okay, I like the visuals, I like the theme, I, I'm not going to disagree with you on, you know, the song numbers, song numbers are absolutely fantastic, I love the Prince Ali deal, I like the friend like me deal, I loved the fact that they gave, you know, Naomi Omi Scott her own song, I think that's one of the better songs of the movie, but... Oh, I agree. But, um... But yeah, like, like I said, it's not one of those movies that I'm going to be, like, putting it very high up on my list of like, oh, this movie's awesome, this movie's, gr- this movie's like the perfect movie, 
Because like right till you reach that whole new world deal, you start seeing just a domino effect of things just falling down. But that's just me. <laughs> that's just me talking as a critic. Well, you know, and, and the thing is, like, I, I, but I see. I, I'm going to stand my ground. I got to. I really think that was so far the best Disney movie they've ever made, and they've made some sort of missteps. You know, people are not liking the Lion King. Uh, Dumbo does not did not resonate with people, unfortunately. And I had high hopes for Dumbo, but. Um, yeah, I, I honestly, I think Aladdin has been their biggest um, hit as far as what I liked. Um, I know in the box office it did very, very well. It was it was number one for a very long time in the UK and the US. But you know, it, for me, it, like I, I think it ticked all the boxes. Kids loved it. I loved it. Adults loved it. There was great music, talented cast. I, I think it was all around the best they've done so far. I mean, if you don't think Aladdin was the best they've done as far as Disney live action remakes, what would be your number one name? Honestly, what would be my number one for that? That's a really good question. Um, it's a tough I, one, isn't it? it? It is a tough one. For for me personally, I still think that Beauty and the Beast is kind of like the standard point for me because, yes, I understand that, you know, there's a lot of people that didn't like some of the, you know, add-ons. They didn't like some of the casting. I still thought that they did pretty good. Yes, I understand auto-tuning is becoming a deal right now, and, and there's a lot of people that hate that. I get that. Um, but I mean, even w- without that, I really loved the performances that everybody put on. I love the fact that Obi Wan Kenobi was Lumiere. Oh my God, that made me just so giddy in so many different ways. I made the comparison that after watching this movie, I kind of felt like I was watching it with a younger version of myself, and we're just kind of sitting there next to each other, and we're kind of just smiling at each other. It's oh, kind that's of, sweet. It's one of those strong comparisons I can make that it was that well done. I liked it. I loved the fact that they add little details. Was it basically the same story? Yeah, but at the same time, there's still some great stuff that can come out of those, you know, same tongue stories, as long as you fill in the little gaps there. You know, what happened to Belle's mom? We got that answered there. Was there a little more of a connection between, you know, between Beast and Belle? Yeah, there was a little more of a connection, because they had something a bit in common. Do you see, you know, we kind of do get that sad moment of, you know, everybody turns into the... uh, "Quote unquote appliances that they turn into, and it seems like oh, all hope is lost. Even though you kind of know what the ending is going to be like, it's still sad to see that kind of moment where it's like, oh, geez, she's too late. Um, but yeah, in my opinion, I still say Beauty and the Beast. Even though there's probably some other people that might, I think if I had a close number two, I would definitely probably put Maleficent on there. Even though I'm not the biggest fan of it, I can't deny the fact that at least they did something different with it, and it's good enough to get a sequel, which, oh my god, I'm looking forward to that sequel more than I'm looking forward to certain other. Oh, the sequel looks so good. Have you seen the preview yet? Uh, it looks amazing. Oh my gosh. I am literally looking at this, and I'm thinking, okay, so this is Disney going Games of Thrones. I'm totally okay with this. Yeah, totally. Same vibe. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. So, definitely want to talk about a couple of other movies that happened here, and guys, of course, you know us being wrestling fans. There is one movie out there that definitely embodies what we love about wrestling, and that's the movie Fighting With My Family. The movie's talking about Paige. Oh my gosh, I love this movie, and even if I made the comment that it's not completely 100% historically accurate, I don't care at this point. I really love, you know, I love how they portrayed Paige. I love the fact that they, you know, brought the family involved in this. It just made it so, so very... It was just so much fun just to see this. And, you know, I got a friend who is not quite a wrestling fan, but I brought her to see this movie. We watched it, and she was like, well, I really love this movie. I thought it was very well done. It's like, I know, right? I love the and fact... And now, are they into wrestling? I bet, I bet they, that made them, like, curious about it. Well, I may have also taken them to see Money in the Bank uh, last year, so they're, they're not <laughs> 100% on the bandwagon for as far as wrestling goes, but... Anytime I say, like, oh, you want to go to a wrestling event? They're more open to it. Now they're like, oh, yeah, definitely. I'm totally down for this. And I, I love that that movie did that for fans. Like, I will say, I, I watched a little bit of Total Divas. Not really Total Bellas, more Total Divas when my friend Alicia Foxy was on it. Um, I watched it when it first came out a bit just to see what it was about. And then, of course, I, I revisited it when um, Alicia was in it. Um, and I love that the movie Fighting With My Family and Total Divas and now Total Bellas has made, especially women, into wrestling. Like, a lot of wrestling fans will tell me, oh, my wife or my girlfriend really didn't like wrestling, and then she but she watches the Fiddle Divas, so now she's agreed to come with me to wrestling shows, and now she's agreed to kind of give wrestling a chance. So for that reason, I think it's really nice to make it mainstream. And also, like, what? There's something, a movie that you probably have seen, uh, The Wrestler with Mickey Rourke. Oh, yeah. That movie, now, granted, it was it was a fantastic movie. You know, I, I talked to Mick Foley about this, and we had the same view, that as a movie uh, on its own, as a standalone film, it was great. But if you're in wrestling and somebody has seen The Wrestler, they think wrestling is just this horrible, 
seedy, you know, steroids in the locker room. That's never a thing that's ever happened. By the way, I've been in a zillion locker rooms. It's not a thing. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of um, uh, tarnished the name of wrestling. But the problem is, it's not the movie's fault. The film was about the, the downtrodden version of, uh, is it Randy the Ram, I believe. Yep. Um, you know, and, and I always try to explain to people, listen, you didn't get to see Randy the Ram in his heyday when it was, you know, uh, amazing and he was at his prime. The movie is not about that. It's a film about him after. So, of course, he's doing these horrible shows and he's in a horrible state of mind and, you know, uh, doing horrible things. Um, but for that reason, I'm glad that Fighting With My Family and Total Divas has sort of elevated the, the idea of wrestling to the mainstream because, as you know, Nate, like, we love wrestling, but in some ways, wrestling is a blip on the radar. I had this conversation with some of the guys from Screen Stalker and we were saying, you know, that the media in Britain, probably same as the U.S., sports are this its own genre and then wrestling is a very small genre in the genre of sports so overall people don't know what to think about it and if they see the wrestler they go oh my god what are you involved in Val like what is this business <laughs> like no it's not like that <laughs> it's more like you know total divas or fighting with family it's, it is glitz and glamour if it wasn't you know me Nate I wouldn't have time for it if there weren't sequins I wouldn't be, be around <laughs> right exactly and I think you hit the nail on the head is that with the wrestler it does kind of give you an idea of, you know, the downfall of some of these wrestlers. And there's so many cases where we see somebody basically trying to recapture the glory days. I mean, even nowadays, we still yes. see that yeah. with, you know, in WWE, we see, you know, guys like Undertaker, Goldberg, a lot of these wrestlers, Shawn Michaels and Triple H, these guys, you know, they're trying to recapture the glory days. They're trying to do that. And they have to realize that, you know, it's finally time to hang up the boots entirely. And, you know, even some of the younger wrestlers, some of the wrestlers that, you know, realize that, uh, you know, that maybe they're not cut out for this. They have to realize that, you know, hey, there's other stuff that you can do. You don't have to, you know, basically kill yourself to try to be somebody else. You could be a great manager. You could be one of those, like, behind-the-scenes deals that you could do that. And I think that's one of the things that the wrestler does is that, you know, it shows us what goes on behind the scenes. And there's still a lot of people back there that, you know, help these people get through these things. And one of the things that I appreciate from the wrestler is the fact that, you know, yes, it was dark, it was gritty, but it does share that truth of that, hey, it isn't, like you said, it isn't all about the glitz and the glamour. It is a tough business because you still have to be wanted. You still have to have, you know, people say, hey, I really love this person. And there's, you know, fans every now and then that will say, say like, oh, you're this person, you're this person. Uh, I'll share like a little funny story before we kind of move on from this. Uh, when I was at work yesterday at Quick Trip, I actually had two fans that were wrestling fans. One was wearing a Stone Cold Steve Austin shirt, and one had an AEW shirt. Uh, pl shout out to AEW, especially for All Out coming back to Chicago. I love you guys, and I look forward to seeing you guys in a few weeks. Um, but, you know, just getting a chance to kind of talk to them and have that kind of interaction with the guy with the Steve Austin shirt. Yes, we basically did the whole, <laughs> whole Stone Cold spiel, where basically I said to him, okay, what, anything else? He's like, oh, yeah, I want this. What? I want this. What? And after that second time, he just was like, I got you, I got you. <laughs> Can you believe that's still a thing? Like, imagine, like, I remember watching wrestling when it started, and it will never die. It's just one of those chants, my God, it will never go away. Well, see, the thing is that I think people abuse that what chant, because when somebody was do doing that, like, you know, if it was like, a, if it was like a, you know, like somebody speaking a different language, you know, I understand that. But if somebody is just out there, and there's <laughs> four of them, they're just going to say, what, what, what? It's like... Don't do that. No, yeah, focus Yeah, when someone's it. trying to cut a serious promo, have you, have you been there when they've tried to do that, like, all they do is say what to them? It's like, come on. Like, let, yeah. them, let them try to get over. Yeah. And uh, I was going to say about the uh, AEW guy, you know, I talked to him, and I said, oh, I'm going to All Out. Are you going out? It's like, well, unfortunately, tickets are already sold out and stuff like that. And <laughs> and I remember just, just ending by just saying, you know, be elite, be, be elite. He just raises his hand up into the skies. It's like, yes, this is why I love wrestling fans, because... They're easy to talk to. They're a lot of fun to you know get along with. They're just really great to see that. And like you said, it's that connection that is now being transitioned into movies that's bringing the audience into a bigger picture. Now, obviously, we're in a world now that there are different kinds of wrestling. We talk about you know WWE. Now we got AEW. You got New Japan. Uh, for those that are still fans of that and are still hoping for a season five, dear lord, hopefully Lucha Underground comes back because I want there to be like a final conclusion for that. But you know, and it, was, it was such a cool alternative. It was I, I watched some of it. It's kind of like a soap opera. Like I loved that it was so different. And there's alternatives, meaning like Impact Wrestling or AEW. But Lucha Underground was like a totally different um, feel. Don't you agree? No, definitely do agree with that. And like we were saying, 
we're bringing all this different audience in there, and there's different types of wrestling that everybody likes. Some people like the action. Some people like the drama. Some people like the romance that might be involved with that. Although, I don't think too many wrestling companies do romantic storylines anymore, and I'm kind of missing that, actually. But the problem is that people are going to be like, oh, well, they're not actually romantically involved because this person's dating this person. Oh, no. No, Joey Ryan wouldn't be making out with this person because he's married. It's like, it's a character deal. It's like watch, going to a theater. You don't just say these things while you're watching a play and be like, oh, I can't. sequence, as I mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't be into it. I, I love the storylines, the drama, and the soap opera aspect. Like, that's what got me into it. Not the athleticism and stuff I appreciated later, but that's what I love about wrestling is the drama. It's not because they're fighting, it's why they're fighting. Who's getting revenge on who, and, you know, who's cutting a promo. That's what I loved about it, and still do. Yep, and guys, for those of you that are thinking that we're turning this into a wrestling deal, it still kind of transitions into movies because they have the <laughs> same aspect of it. So I'll go. we'll go back into the movie so that way some people might be thinking like, oh, I thought you were going to say the wrestling deal for two weeks. All right, all right, we're going back to movies, we're going back to movies. Uh, if we want to talk about big movies, and definitely absolutely fantastic movies, i got to ask you, Val, did you get a chance to see Godzilla, King of the Monsters? No, and what's funny, oh. what's not funny, but um, the people from Screen Stalker did get to see it, and one of the guys is a huge Godzilla fan, and he really didn't like it. Really? Um, I, I'm such a huge, I know, I was shocked too, because I, I heard good reviews about it, but they did not like it. Millie Bobby Brown, who was in the film, of course, I'm a huge Stranger Things fan, I can't even wait to talk, we need, we need like an entire Stranger Things podcast, I yes. just finished it like a couple days ago, love, love, love the series. Um, but yeah, as far as people that I've met have not really liked it, but I saw good reviews online, so I, I like your take on it. Is, is it worth a watch? Because if it is, I'll watch it. If so, you give it the okay. So, so here's the thing about it. There's a lot of people that have complained about, oh, there's very little human interaction. It's all about the monsters. It's all about this. It's all about the blah, 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 blah. It's like, okay, um, quick question. What's the title of this? Godzilla, King of the Monsters. Hmm. So you're That's saying, what I was thinking, as you said it, I'm like it's, it should be all about. It. That's the whole point, right? It's it's like so you're basically complaining that in a title that's basically talking about King of the Monsters. It's a movie about these monsters coming in and battling it out. You're complaining that there's too much of that. Mm. Okay, so why don't you go back in time? Tell that to the people who created this absolute phenomenon that is Godzilla, and tell them that there's too much of this and have more human interactions. Yeah, why don't you tell them that? See how well that goes for that. I loved this movie. I loved the action sequences. Did you? The, okay. It was one of those movies that, I, after the first one, I kind of understood why people were very disdainful about it because there was maybe too much people interaction, not enough monster deals. In this one, it was because of the action that I loved. I loved seeing all of these, you know, these monsters. You see Godzilla. You see King Ghidorah. You see Rodan. You see all of these monsters coming in. And it's setting up for the big film. That is, of course, being Godzilla versus King Kong. And this was a great way to do it because you're introducing, hey, there's all of these monsters out there. There's going to be probably one monster that goes into, you know, Skull Island and it's probably going to attract Godzilla. Godzilla goes over, we get King Kong, boom, you got yourself a movie there. And the end credit scene has this guy having one of the heads of King Ghidorah on there, and all I think to myself is, okay, we're getting Mecha, Mecha Ghidorah in one of the future films, and I'm okay with this. I want to see this so bad, so badly now. It's just one of those movies that, yes, is it filled with drama? Not as much. But it is a movie that is filled with action, and that's something that a lot of people need to have. They need to have the, those kind of action sequences or just purely action-based movies 100%. that are not just, you know, Mission Impossible or Fast and Furious or Terminator or any of these other things. you got to have some of these movies that give it a little more variety. Yes, it's completely CGI monsters, but it's CGI monsters in the best possible way. It was awesome. But that's what I would expect from the film. Like, that, that's what I would want from the film. But I have to ask you, because you mentioned Skull Island. Like, for me, I didn't see that. I saw King Kong go with Jack Black. I loved it, but I was really freaked out of the dinosaur <laughs> and, like, bug scenes. I'm telling you, I, I, I'll i be honest. But you know we're honest on this podcast. I walked out of the theater. I was really freaked out. <laughs> <laughs> really? Oh I, dude, I up and left. I left. I was like, no. I'm getting, like, creepy crawly feelings just talking about it. That freaked me out. So I have to ask you, um, how scary is this movie on, like, a scale of, like, 1 to 10? Like, am I going to have to walk out of the room if I watch it? <laughs> now I'm freaked out. Um... I think I would probably put it at like a 
six or a seven. It's it's a very mo- there's some points where it does get kind of freaky. That's I'm not high. gonna. That's I, high. I'm, 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 I'm not gonna lie. There, there is a point. Uh, I don't know how big of a fan you are for like Jurassic Park or something like that. There is a kind of like a recreation moment where Ghidorah actually looks through a window and it kind of looks like almost like the T Rex when he looks through the window. Well, to I the love kids. Jurassic Park, but I'm, I'm a huge like paleontologist. Nerd, but I have okay. to say, like, it was scary as a kid. Actually, speaking of walking out, my mom and I, uh, she didn't mean, when, I don't know how old I was, whenever it came out, I was young. And, uh, you know, because I'm so young, Nate. Uh, <laughs> she, she walked us out. I remember we, we walked out during the scene where the kids are in the car and the glass is on top of them. Oh. And there's, like, sludge coming in. Yeah, she, she literally took us out of, the, out of the theater. She was like, no, this is too scary. <laughs> Thank God she did, because we were, we were freaked out. Oh, man. I mean... I, I will say, say this, that it does give you... I, there are some moments in older movies that I still remember thinking, oh gosh, I remember being afraid of this as a kid. Like, uh, for me, it was the uh, Rite of Spring in Fantasia. I was always creeped out about that because even though there was like no... super weird. It's it, like an acid trip. Mm. I, mean, I mean, it's one of those things where, you know, they don't have any dialogue. They don't have like that much noise sound. It's all music, and it's all relying on the visuals as well as on the music and it's done so damn well especially the dinosaur scene oh my gosh that I mean if you watch the like dinosaur scene where you have you know the T-Rex taking on the stegosaurus you watch that in the dark it is one of the creepiest things that you will ever see and the music just makes it that creepy and also the visuals it's one of those movies that does a fantastic job so I will say this if you ever plan on doing like a sit down like movie watching deal I would say to you guys and the rest of the Screen Stalkers, definitely just watch Fantasia, the original one, and just have it be nothing but just in the dark. And see if you get the same chills that oh I still get from that. scary. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Would that be one of those moments where it's like, yep, nope, Nate, I hate you for making me do this. Yeah. I, why, did you, why did you suggest this? Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes, like, like spooky circus type, like, things like that. Like, I, I, I always joke and say an acid trip. That kind of stuff sometimes scares me more than something that's overtly scary. Like, aliens kind of freak me out. They've always freaked me out. Um, ghosts scare me, but, like, that kind of circusy vibe, like, uh, you know, festival, big top, ugh, clowns, no. No, no, no. Never saw any of those Ed films. People talk about it. I'm like, nope. <laughs> Not for me. Well, I will say, say this, that um, if you want another movie to avoid, I will definitely say that still, so far, the worst movie I've seen this year has been the remake of Child's Play. This was one of those movies really? I, I had certain expectations for, but it did feel like one of those movies where they did try to you know, add some twists, they add some turns. It's like, okay, I understand where they got that from, but my friend who is like a horror movie, like, who's kind of a horror movie critic, but he also kind of just does these things in, like, his free time. It's kind of one of those things where he could not take the movie seriously. There's so many moments where he was just actually laughing more than anything because he was just saying, this is so stupid. And I agreed with him. There were some points where I was even laughing, like, oh, my God, the plot is so riddled with holes. It is so dumb how they try to do these things. They're like, oh, this will be cooler if they do it this route. It's like... No, they're, it's not. It's it's in fact dumber, and honestly, we prefer the original one better. The only thing that was good about oh, it were, were the kill sequences. So, shockingly enough, it's, it's a murder film, and it's about the kill sequences. Yeah, the kill sequences were definitely one of those things that were definitely worth watching, but if you're not a fan of that, definitely the Ixnay. I would definitely say it's up there with like a high 8 or 9 for like Spook You. Probably should not be watching this. Hello. Oh God! Well, you, know, what you you spoke about like watching a movie and thinking it's dumb. Like I hate to say it, I, I, I think I told you about this already. Actually, um, one of the movies that I people loved and I went and saw. I think I saw it in the, the theater or, and or at home. I think I gave it two tries actually. When I was watching Transformers, okay, I am I am trust me, I am not a person that's like super hard to please the movies. I, I give it a chance. Well, hold on, I, hold on. Know, are you talking like the first Transformers? Or are you talking about the sequel? Yeah. The very first Transformers Okay, movie. okay. I thought it was so terrible. And I thought, well, maybe I'll give it another try. I was literally laughing. Like, this is the dumbest thing I've seen in a long time. I <laughs> hated it. And people loved it. And then, you know, it's funny. Uh, you know, a, a lot of wrestling fans liked the movie. So I think I tweeted about it and said, like, this is, like, laughably bad. And people were like, what are you talking about? It was great. And I'm like, I'm sorry. But I gave it two chances. I was like, this is the dumbest bleep. I've never seen it in my life. <laughs> it was so bad. I, I, I really, it, it was just, I mean, it was like, I just didn't believe anything they were saying. I thought it was cheesy. You know, some movies are cheesy and it's great. Like, there are certain parts of Stranger Things I don't want to give it away. But it's very, like, 80s cheesy. I appreciate that. I mean, it's kind of like a wink at the camera. They know they're being cheesy. This was like, 
horrendous. And it's so funny to me that like Universal Studios now has it's either a ride or a show that's Transformers. And I'm just like, I don't know who likes these films, but oh my god, I thought it was so bad. I don't know about you. What did you think of it? Um, I think I understand, you know, where you're coming from with you know, the fact that, you know, it's like the really bad kind of there were some moments in there that I was just like, Yeah, wow, this uh this is really, really dumb. It's not the best Transformers <laughs> I'm, I'm really, I'm really watching this. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, I mean, I still enjoyed it for what it was worth, but I definitely did see like a downward spiral when it just came to every single sequel. The second one, I think, was definitely one of the lower points, especially when you have two twins that are probably the most racist things you'll probably ever see on a big screen. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm like, I'm kind of like, I'm not the mind that I think Megan Fox is like one of the most gorgeous girls. She's a beautiful girl. If she can't save your movie, then you're screwed. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> no, no, I agree. I definitely do agree with that. There is no denying that. Um, so, okay, we've definitely talked about, you know, some of the, like, the bad movies, some of the really good movies. I think it's finally time that we take these last few, the last, actually, like, quite a few bit of the podcast to talk about one of the best movies we've seen, and honestly, one of the highest grossing movies of all time, that, of course, being Avengers Endgame. I've seen this movie yes. a grand total of five times. I had to make it a round number. And yes, I guess you could say that's my hey, homage the to book. The movie's like three plus hours, isn't it? That's a long, that's a good commitment. I'm proud. Wow. <laughs> five times. Well, I mean, I had a little bit of practice considering, you know, most of the WWE pay per views are about six, seven hours long. So That is true. <laughs> so, They're so long now. It's, oh, my God. <laughs> it's kind of one of those things where it's like, oh, wow, I really do appreciate these highlight packages right here. Um, but yeah, when it comes to. Avengers Endgame. This was one of those movies where a lot of people still find enough reasons to just, you know, pick on some of these certain moments. Like, of course, they'll talk about, you know, the time travel deals. Like, but it doesn't do the same thing. Like, you know, like the Back to the Future deal, which they address during this movie. They, I love the fact that they do address during this movie the fact that, oh, hey, you know, t- you know Hot Tub Time Machine, Back to the Future, all these other movies that battle with time travel, and they're just saying, like, no, Th- this is how time travel works in our universe, and it's like okay, it's still kind of sticky, but at least it still holds up to a certain point, I guess you could say. No, I get you, and I'm so so sorry to interrupt you, but <laughs> really quick, did you love Hot Tub Time Machine? Because I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think I think the first one was absolutely hilarious. Oh my god, I don't know how. It, I think my brother-in-law showed it to me. I was like, why are we watching this? This is so dumb. And then I watched it. I was like. What a great film. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> Only because you mentioned it, I had to ask your opinion because I, I, I loved it. It was so funny. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, honestly, this is just basically telling the story of them trying to get redemption for everything that happened in Infinity War. You know, the whole deal with the snap, being able to, you know, come back from that. They go back and they get back all the Infinity Stones. They bring everybody back. And I will say this, that when it comes to this movie, there's at least three parts in this entire movie that I still get either teary-eyed or I cry at. And it's all five times, it was always those same moments. Uh, I think the earliest moment was when uh, Scott reunites with his daughter. Just that moment there was just like, oh gosh, just mm, pulling at my heartstrings, just seeing these two back together again. It's absolutely awesome. And I think the major one, of course, is the scene with Tony, Tony Stark's death, which honestly still has one of the most pivotal moments where you know, Thanos is just saying, I am inevitable. Snap. Nothing happens. Wait, what? Wait. Uh, Tony Stark dies? <laughs> I was about to say what? that. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I've seen it. <laughs> and then, and then, and then, and then, of course, he has just the stones. Kidding. Kidding. And Tony Stark, of course, has the epic line, the one that probably made him famous, that being, and I am Iron Man. And just in a flash, everything changes. Thanos is oh. gone. All of his armies are just All absolutely... Feels. It's just absolutely... Dead. And I will say this, that I actually got a chance to see one of the deleted scenes from this movie. It is basically one of those scenes where it's like, okay, this would have been really cool to keep in the movie, but I understand that they had to cut it because of time, probably. Um, what bas- was the scene? So basically... How did you see it? Uh, I was on YouTube. It got. It didn't get leaked. It was just one of those things where people just decided, "Oh, hey, here's the deleted scene from Avengers End- Endgame." And uh, okay, I mean, they also did a re-release of Avengers Endgame where they put in all these deleted scenes and stuff like that, just so that they could beat, you know, Avatar in the highest-grossing box office deal, which I understand. Some people are criticizing them, but it's like, hey, you gotta take an advantage when you got it. 
people love the movie, and they're going to want to probably see a lot of these new, you know, deleted scenes deal. But the one I'm talking about is basically after, uh, you know, Potts has kind of said her piece to Tony, saying, saying, hey, we're going to be okay, you can rest now. Tony passes on the do deal, and we see Hawkeye, and it goes to him taking a knee. Black Panther looks behind, he takes a knee as well. Then we see Captain Marvel take a knee. And we see, like, this kind of circumference deal of people just taking a knee out of respect for Tony Stark. It was just such a moment where it's like, this just shows how much Tony meant to the Avengers. This just shows how 100%. much Robert Downey meant I don't know about you, but my, my favorite uh, Marvel film, so it's not barking, well, my favorite Marvel film was the Iron Man. I think it's like, that's the most flawless Marvel movie ever made. I love, love, loved it. And I think, you know, him being the one that, unfortunately, spoiler alert, did pass on, it was like, that was, that cut the deepest. We love Thor, we love Captain America, but Tony Stark, to me, was the OG. He was the original. And, oh my gosh, I, I, I knew something was going to happen sad in that movie. But I, was not, I wasn't prepared for it. I really wasn't. It's, I, I don't even want to watch it again, because I'm like, I might have to fast forward to the scene, because it really cut very deep. I love him, I love his whole character. Um, I didn't love the Pepper Park, we've had this conversation before, I didn't love the Pepper Park thing where she kind of like became a superhero and like Iron Man 3, I was like, alright, whatever. But <laughs> I love him, love what he stands for, I think he's fun. Yeah, it's just, that, that scene was just, oh, just right in right the feels, right? Oh, oh just right in yes. the feels. Like I said, it's one of those scenes that I still cry at after watching it because it is one of those things where you kind of watch, you know, like an end of an era. This is one of those things where it's like you're seeing... The, the guy who was basically like a patriarch for the Marvel exactly. Cinematic Universe, he and he's gone. And then later on we see the same thing kind of happen with Captain America, but except with him dying, he kind of decides, I'm going to live life. I'm going to go back and I'm going to basically live the life the way that I want to live it instead of being... You know, a hero, which honestly, it's understandable. It's one of those things where it's like this. That dang. killed me. I love because I, I I always loved his and uh, Peg's uh, you know love story, Peggy. Yeah, I thought yeah. they were so perfect together, and I remember thinking it was really sad that he never got to to live that life. So so I said to Alan, uh, my husband, he hadn't seen it. I was like, I don't want to give any spoilers away. But like there are certain wrongs that were righted, and when they when they made that a thing where he got to live that life finally I just thought oh my god that's what that's what I wanted out of Captain America I love the films I love Winter Soldier especially I thought it was a flawless film I just thought how did he not get to have this life with Peggy they made this huge love story out of it and then when they righted that wrong in that movie I just thought this is perfect this is like it gave me closure as silly as that sounds not to get emotional but it gave me closure for their storyline it really did no I definitely do agree with that and it still has to this day, one of the greatest end title sequences that you'll ever see. I mean, they have, like, the credits of, like, you know, oh, you know, Dave Batista, our boy Dave! Shout out to Batista, buddy! Um, we love you know, him! <laughs> we definitely do. Um, he, you know, they have, you know, all these characters coming in, but then they get into the original Avengers, and they have, you know, all, you know, they have basically, like, this backdrop of, like, an action sequence or something like that, and then they have a silhouette of them, and then they have their signatures on there. That is by far my favorite end credit sequence ever because it shows the amount of respect that Marvel Studios has for these individuals. You know, uh, I agree. Just you know, you know, uh, Scar Scarlett Johansson, uh, you know, Chris Evans, to Robert Downey Jr. Everybody there that was just a part of the original Avengers that started this huge revolution. They gave them the proper dues that they absolutely deserved and it's just one of those things where you, you see so many people of course they do this deal where they shouldn't be doing this they record on their phones and you see like the reactions of people having you know, you know oh there's Hawkeye there's Natasha there's Hulk there's Thor there's there's you know there's uh, Captain America there's Iron Man yeah everybody's just you know you feel the reaction but it's still one of those things where it's like I'm kind of hate the fact that they did this because it spoils so much for fans but I'm also kind of glad they did do this because it shows the amount of passion, the amount of love that people have for these movies. I mean, she mentioned so many great movies that have definitely hit us. Honestly, you know, Iron Man has definitely been one of those guys that has been a pivotal moment. We've definitely said he's kind of one of, like, the cornerstones of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Captain America, same thing. You could say, you know, Thor, you could say Hulk have been kind of there. But 
when it came down to it, Captain America and Iron Man were just like the two staples that kept everything together. Now we're going on to phase four, and it's like, well, where do we go from now? Where, it's where? crazy. But, but but don't you feel like, again, without sounding super sappy, like we grew up with these films. We grew up with Iron Man and, oh, the, yes. and these actors. And it was just that that for me was a big deal because it was like, oh, my gosh. You know, the first Iron Man movie uh, onward and then to in Thor and Captain America. And, and it's just I, I really feel like it was a part of my not childhood, but kind of like my growing up, really. No, definitely. I agree with that. And honestly, Oh gosh, I'm gonna I'm gonna hate when when this happens. If they do kind of do like a moving on deal with uh, Spider Man, that's gonna be a tough day for me. That's gonna be a day where I'm probably gonna be like inconsolable to the point where it's like nobody talk to me. I'm just gonna be in a cave right now. I need to oh. express every bit of my emotions here. There's gonna be a stream of water. I'm helping out the environment, but at the same time, I'm basically letting every single fluid of my body out because Spider Man's gone. That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> Top that, Daniel Bryan. <laughs> I'm kidding. Oh, gosh. Oh, man. Yeah, what a hippie he is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, he's a hippie, but he's going to be feuding with Roman Reigns, guarantee it. But that's a different story for yes. another podcast. Um, yeah, but like we've said, guys, there's been... Honestly, I look at back at all the movies that I've seen, and I could probably say how many movies I've seen. It's been a lot this year, and the year's not even over yet. So I'm going to be very curious to see how many movies I have on the good list compared to the bad list. And my bad list compared to last year is so minuscule right now. That's great. It's one of those things where you look at these movies and you see, you know, there's been like a hit after hit after hit. There's been movies that I've even been like, well, this seems kind of stupid. Like, I'll admit this, I, two movies that I saw kind of back-to-back were Ugly Dolls and Long Shot. Ugly Dolls was just kind of like those kiddish movies that I thought, okay, this just seems kind of cute. I like it just because somehow the Ugly Dolls look more appealing than the actual people that they had in there but I watched it I'm just like I actually like this movie it's not one of my favorites but it's a movie that I actually kind of enjoyed and it does have a really good message behind it there's some people saying like oh this singer can't act Blake Shelton can't act or uh, gosh I'm trying to remember who else was involved in that um, people but, always are so negative with reviews. Uh, that, that's the problem. Like that, that's what I'm happy with Screen Stalker and, the, and with you. Yeah, there's some movies we don't like. For the most part, we stay positive and we appreciate movies for what they are. Like you said about Godzilla, like that's what you wanted. You wanted it to be monster based, and you know it, that's why I said about Transformers. It makes me uh, kind of sad to say it that I didn't like it. But to be honest, like that's only one of the movies in like you know tons that I've seen that I didn't like. Most movies I'll give a chance and I go, hey, even if it's not for me. That's fine. Someone else might love it, you know. So that's nice. I think I think positive movie reviews are what we're missing in society. It's all this negativity and this, you know. Uh, oh, I hate that. I think social media fuels that a little bit as well. No, I definitely do agree with that. And I will say one other positive thing that we can get out of this year, other than great you know, Marvel movies, is the fact that we also got a really good live-action Pokemon movie, which is one of the highest-grossing video game movies of all time now. Yes! Detective they, Pikachu! Yes, thank you, Ryan Reynolds. You have saved the movie universe again, whether <laughs> you're Deadpool or Detective Pikachu. Honestly, I was kind of surprised at the end, because there was a part of me that thought, like, well... You know, he's just going to voice Pikachu. That's all it's going to be. Then it turns out that he's the dad of the main character. I'm like, I did not see this coming. I legit did not see this coming. I thought that they would have just kept it, you know, kind of like, you know, know, ethnic deal. But it's like, nope, nope, it's Ryan Reynolds. I'm like, oh, I'm still okay with this. I'm still okay with this. I get to see Ryan Reynolds. He's so good. You know, I talked about Screen Stalker before. I I started to like him in Blade Trinity. I started to like his wit, his humor. I did not like Green Lantern. I did not like a couple films he was in. But for the most part, I think he's great. I did not like Deadpool. People are shocked to hear that. I didn't like it. But him as Pikachu and him, you know, in comedic roles, I think that's where he really, really thrives. I think he's a comedic actor. And, you know, he's he's just so likable. You know, it's like Pikachu... Is likable anyway. To put Ryan Reynolds in there, he's just—he's just fun. He's just a fun guy. It seems like. No, definitely do agree with that. So, unfortunately, guys, we're going to have to end it on that note. This has been another edition of the Game Changer Podcast. It's another sad day, but. Like I've said before, this is not going to be the last time that you're going to be hearing the lovely SoCal Val on this podcast. We will be back for another edition. Oh, yes. And it's going to be wrestling related as we talk about All Out. And it's going to be an absolutely fantastic weekend. I can tell you guys this right now. I'm really looking forward to it because I've already got my tickets to see John Moxley, CM Punk, oh, and as well and as well as Sting. Oh my gosh, it's going to be freaking amazing. Uh, I am going to have to. I'm probably going to have to send you a message to, to be like, 
Val, is there anything that I should say to Sting that might make him remember you? <laughs> <laughs> He's so great. I will say, if I can ask one question, I know we're, we're over time, but I have to ask you. What films, because we're talking about films, what films are you looking forward to seeing that are coming out soon? Because for me, um, I've not seen Hobbs and Shaw yet, and I really want to see it. But are there any films that you're looking forward to that the, that the listeners might um, be intrigued by? Honestly, right now, uh, It Chapter 2 has definitely been one of those movies that I am so much looking forward to. Yes, it's a horror flick, but I am loving the fact that they are going forward with this. I love the fact that, you know, we're getting a different version of the TV series that we got uh, yay long time ago with Tim Curry. Love the man. Uh, I also am looking forward to Maleficent uh, to, uh, I think it was a Mistress of Evil, which honestly, yep. even the title Good itself, choice. oh my gosh, that's going to be awesome. And for those that even are going to be critiquing this, Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker. I'm looking forward to that film. I love what the trailer's oh, of introducing to it. And some people that may have said, like, well, The Last Jedi was a bit of a farce. It was entertaining. So what? I don't care. Was, I loved it. And I'm sorry to, again, keep going over time, but I have to get your thoughts. What do you think of Angelina joining the Marvel Universe? That's a huge deal for me. I love her. You know, it is a huge deal, and I will say this. I think it was going to happen eventually, because they already had her hooked on when they had her playing Maleficent, so there's probably going to be some kind of situation where it'd be like, you know, since you love the Disney universe, maybe you'd like to come over here to our nice little Marvel universe, and I think that it's going to be very interesting to <laughs> come see. Come on over here. <laughs> <laughs> come over here. The water's great. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> exactly. Oh, my gosh. So, guys, we're going to wrap up this edition of the Game Changer Podcast, but before we do, it's time for some cheap plugs. Miss Valerie, do you have anything that you would like to plug in here? I know you have a lot of social media that you'd like to plug, but do you have any big events that are coming up that people would probably love to see you at, as well as love to I'm interact with so you? I'm glad you asked. That's so nice of you, Nate. Um, speaking of, I might as well plug a couple things. I am going to um, continue doing stu- uh, Screen Stalker, which is um, on YouTube. You can find all of our videos if you search for Screen Stalker. Also, Wrestle Talk is our sister company. It's all wrestling-based, of course, and I do videos for them once in a while. We review different pay-per-views, different feuds that are going on in wrestling, but Screen Stalker is all film and TV-based. Um, I'm going to Pakistan in a few weeks. I haven't even told right. you that, Nate. Oh, my gosh. For Ring of Pakistan. That'll be um, at the end of August. My first time over there. That'll be amazing. Doing ring announcing. Right. Uh, there's some Americans on the card as well. Chris Masters, a couple guys going um, yes. that I've known for years, but it's going to be amazing. I did commentary for them a few months ago. Um, also, I've got some uh, conventions coming up. And if you're UK-based, just please follow me on Twitter, at SoCalValerie, uh, or on Instagram, at OfficialSoCalVal. You can see all of my projects that I'm working on. But yeah, I've got some Comic-Cons coming up. Uh, Pakistan ring announcing is going to be amazing, and a lot of uh, autograph signings as well. So please follow me, if you don't mind. And yeah, <laughs> I'm always around. You know, Nate, I'm always posting. Oh, Social definitely. Media. Definitely. Definitely check out her social media, and I'm also going to do a cheap plug for her as well. Definitely check out her Patreon page. It is legitimately yes, some of the best content you, you will see, and she definitely treats her Patreons like very good people. I will tell you this oh, right now. Thank you. Every, every now and then we get a chance to interact, we get a chance to talk. It's absolutely great. So if you want to get a chance to actually interact with her that's not just on social media, but also through personal DMs, definitely check her out on her Patreon. Do a little cheap plug thank for you. that. You uh, know what Patreon is for me, Nate? It's, it's basically just an excuse to do photo shoots. Like, that's <laughs> what I love doing. I love doing photo shoots, lingerie, bikini shoots especially, and that's what Patreon's about. But the great thing for me is yeah interacting with the fans and you know a lot of my friends now I've, I've known these guys for a long time there's a couple girls on there as well but obviously it's more male based but DMs are open and you know having the photo shoots having the Periscope chats where you can talk to everybody is always so much fun so yes it's patreon.com slash SoCalVal definitely and I'm going to say this right now there is a part of me that would love to suggest the idea of you doing like a Skull Island th- themed <laughs> photo shoot oh. uh, I, just I, like, was, I like I like a theme. And it would just be one of those things where it's like, you know, really, I didn't have much of a reason for this except for the fact that I kind of wanted to give her the heebie-jeebies again just so she can relive the whole Kong, King Kong movie deal. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, just, it's just one of those things where it's like, am I getting payback? No, no, no. Never. Oh I, I remember leaving that theater and being like, this is just too much for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, ladies if I ever meet Jack Black, I'm going to tell him, like, I walked out of the theater. No offense, but hey, 
<laughs> oh my he gosh. seems so cool, though. Jack Black is amazing. Shout out to Jack Black. Shout out to all the people that we've definitely mentioned throughout we'll the show. We'll tag him in our posts, right? <laughs> oh, definitely, definitely. So, guys, that has been this edition of The Game Changer, the lovely SoCal Val. I've been Nate the F and great. You've been listening to The Game Changer, listening to it on so many great podcasting formats, including Spotify, iHeartRadio, as well as here on Spreaker.com. And I will tell you guys this, definitely check out Screen Stalkers. It's absolutely awesome. Also, support Wrestle Talk. Give them a subscribe. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Not a problem. And guys, it's only fitting that the only way that we can end this is with the signature catchphrase from Screen Stalkers told by the lovely SoCal Val, reminding us that if you're a part of Screen Stalkers, remember only one thing and one thing only, and that is... We're watching...